Hello people, Zach here again today. And today I'm going to be doing a discussion on uh, communism and why it's not going to save us. So, first of all, we have to define what we mean when we use the word communism, because if you can't define something, you can't reason about it properly. Um, and there's two different ways to define this. There's the colloquial understanding of the term, and then there's the academic understanding of the term. Um, now, the colloquial understanding of the term, I believe, takes precedent over the academic one, because the purpose of language is to communicate ideas. <clears throat> and so if you're using a word and you're not communicating the correct idea, that means you're using the wrong word. Um, <clears throat> now, what is the colloquial understanding of the term? Well, the colloquial understanding of communism is the publicization of goods and services, like or uh, of property. That's another way of looking at it. Um, so when the average person says communism, what they're thinking about is like, this isn't our ho your house, this is our house. This isn't your garden, it's our garden. It's not your vehicle, it's our vehicle. And there's like the Bugs Bunny meme of this, like when someone says that they, they own something, Bugs Bunny is like ours. Um, but what the academic means when they're uh, talking about this is the concept of abolishing private property. And when they say private property, they usually will make a distinction between private property and personal property, where personal property is what an individual owns, whereas private property is um, what a corporation owns. So really what they're advocating against, or what they at least claim to be advocating against, is the um, abolition of corporations being able to own property. Now there is a certain sense in which I agree with this, not, not fully, um, but like in the ideas of residential property. Like I don't think that it's right that a corporation or an organization should be allowed to own residential property uh, because the money that these organizations or um, corporations have comes from investors. Uh, so basically they're able to socialize the cost of buying the property uh, among a large group of people. So they can outbid individuals who would be willing to purchase that property. So they can run around and buying up all of the residential property and then turn the average citizen into a serf class. And I don't, I don't believe that's right at all. I think it's actually criminal that our governments even allow that. But uh, this, just putting this aside, this kind of leads into another issue, um, which is socialism and also capitalism, which um, I'm going to connect these two ideas and you'll see in a moment. So when we're talking about um, socialism, what we're talking about it depends on who you're talking to again. So are you, or do you mean the colloquial understanding of it or do you mean the academic understanding? So the colloquial understanding of socialism, it is that it is the redistribution of wealth uh, in order to socialize the cost of a particular good or service. That's basically what they mean. So they mean like if when they say free health care, it's not actually free. Basically what it is is that everyone is paying into this system, and then from this pool of money, it is being used to pay for your health care. That is what the average person means by socialism, and again, this is the correct understanding of socialism, in my opinion. Um, but the academic understanding of the term is also important here. Um, and it is the collective ownership of the means of production. And what is the means of production? Well, the means of production is what you use to produce goods and services. And what is that? Well, that is, that's capital or stock. There's, there's two different ways of putting it. It's the, it's the land on which you grow things on. It's the resources you use, like the mineral resources. It's the, um, the equipment that you use. It's the labor. It's your, um, your, um, your facilities that you're using to produce things. Like that, that's what capital is. And within a capitalistic economy, what is capitalism? Well, capitalism is like capital-driven economics. Um, but ultimately, it is this idea that people are purchasing shares of a particular um, stock, which is, of course, capital or equity or whatnot in a company. Um, but it means that you are participating in the collective ownership of the means of production. That's what it means. So capitalism, to me, is actually a subset of socialism. And so this is where I think that there's a false dichotomy between communism and capitalism. Um, like a lot of people see these as two opposite sides of the same coin, and there's a reason why they would see it like this, because, uh, of course, capitalism, like I said, according to academics, is the abolition of private property. Uh, and, of course, capitalism as a form of socialism is predicated on this 
um, collective ownership of property. However, capitalism is also... I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. Like I said, capitalism is a form of socialism, and socialism is, in a sense, the redistribution of wealth and the socialization of the cost of these particular things, which comes through publicizing or collectively owning the thing. So in in the colloquial understanding of the term, socialism is almost like a subset of communism when you think about it, because communism is this idea of this, like everything that would have been private is now publicly owned, and now in socialism what we're doing is we're saying we're taking the things that are privately owned, we're making them publicly owned, and then redistributing it back down. So they're not actually polar opposites per se. Um, they're opposites, but they're not polar opposites. Like, it's not like the more capitalistic you get, the less communistic you get. Uh, now, that all said, the... I don't know how you dig yourselves out of this hole that we've got ourselves into, because like what the communists will say is that they say, well, the reason why people are suffering and why is that they're not earning enough money and that the reason why they're not earning enough money is because these corporations are hoarding wealth um, and that they haven't raised the wage wages to match the rate of inflation. Which is somewhat true. I mean, I'm not going to argue that corporations aren't greedy, because they absolutely are. However, it's a misidentification of the issue. Because what you're doing what you're doing here is sort of like saying that the reason why you have a fever is because you have a high temperature. Which is just, it's just not correct. Like, it's, it's, the fever is the high temperature. The temperature is not the cause of the fever. The cause of the fever is that you have an infection, like a viral infection, and your body is raising its body temperature in order to try to kill it. Um, and the same situation happens here. Like, the reason why wages haven't kept up with the rate of inflation is because you have this unrealistic expectation that every com uh, corporation in the entire country and every business in the entire country has the responsibility of watching the rate of inflation and raising their wages in order to keep up with it instead of trying to ask the qu address the reason why the wages I mean why the inflation is occurring in the first place which is government spending government of course creates a deficit through its spending uh, and it has to pay back the interest on that debt at the very least otherwise it becomes bankrupt and the only way that it can do that is by raising tax rates or raising interest rates uh, and that, of course, affects the entire country as a whole. So this lie that they keep trying to tell you that when the uh, inflation is happening is because people are buying more and more product. Well, yes, if people are buying more of an individual product, it will increase the demand on that individual product, uh, which will then raise the price because it creates a shortage. And so they increase the price of the good in order to drive it down. It's basically a price um, cost curve. They'll, they'll, it'll balance itself out. But that only affects the one individual good. Inflation is not individual good increasing in value. It's all goods and services as a whole increasing in value. And there is only one way that you can do that, which is that if you affect the expenses of every single good and service in the entire country, which is something that only government can do. So, um, the reason why is like, well, why does the government spend so much money? And the reason why is because they have control of the money supply. Uh, they can just print more money if they need it. And really what they're doing here is making charges to a credit card that belongs to the future citizens. That is ultimately what you're doing. And I feel like the in our current situation, the boomers are to blame for this. Um, like, they, they, they created all of these systems that benefited themselves at the time. I mean, they lived in basically an economic utopia, unlike the world has ever seen. Like, they had the, lo the highest wages and the lowest cost of living of any generation in human history. And what did they decide to do? Well, they decided to spend all that money on frivolous crap, like getting themselves another boat or getting themselves a second, third house or uh, doing all this other junk. And uh, they decided that they were going to send all of their children to college. And then it just became the expectation when you have so many people going to college that now everyone has to go to college because uh, so many people have degrees that they 
have to basically filter through the people who have degrees. And so if you're going to filter through the people who have degrees, why would you even look at the people who don't have degrees? So it just became an expectation. Like they had all of this money and they decided they were going to put their all of their kids to universities. And now it just became the expectation now that everyone has to have that. And so now you have people in this generation, they're coming out, like they're starting their lives out, 24, 25 years old, with $120,000 worth of student debt. Um, and they're participating in a competitive labor market where a lot of the jobs are even fake because they're, they only exist for the purpose of creating the illusion of growth. Um, so all of these hoops to go through for jobs that largely don't even exist. Um, so how do we get ourselves out of this issue? Like, One of the things the communists will say is, well, if we just increase the wages, we'll solve the problem. Well, I already addressed why that's not going to solve the issue. Because one, um, every corporation in the country cannot absorb the shock of that. We just, we can't. Um, and two, it won't address the actual issue. But um, the other thing that a communist will do is they'll argue for, like, um, price controls. And this is another one of the worst ideas ever because, like, think... The reason why your shoes cost, like, $30 is because the... Think about what went into producing those shoes. Like, think about how many hands had to touch those shoes for them to get to you. A farmer had to drive a tractor on a plantation in 120 degree weather, pulling cotton fibers from plants uh, in the burning heat after it had spent months growing, uh, which then had to be put onto a truck and shipped off to a textile factory, which then had to like wash the fibers and pull out any stems and shit. Um, and then they had to spin those fibers into uh, yarns or threads or whatever, uh, then build the threads into the, the sheets of cloth or whatever, which then got shipped off to another facility that was where it was stored before it was purchased by another company that bought it to make shoes, and then someone had to pay to design the shoes and to cut out all the pieces of cloth and stitch them all together and package them or whatnot. Uh, then the shoes got shipped across the oceans to some other place where they were stored inside of a giant warehouse uh, until they had to be purchased, in which case they were repackaged again, shipped off to a second facility or store or whatever, that then unpacked them and putting onto the shelves, and then someone had to be paid to go down the aisles and stock the shelves with the shoes and to uh, price them and tag them. Um, like, all of these, think about, like, just how many hands had to touch that one single pair of shoes and the fact that every single person in between there, every person who had to touch it, had to be paid to do it. And that's the reason why it costs that much. So when you create price controls where you're, um, where you're not, where you're trying to force, artificially force down the price of a good, uh, if it price gets below the cost of producing the good, or if it gets to the point where they're equal... Uh, there's no reason to sell it because you're just or to even provide that good or service because it costs you money you're losing money just trying to provide it uh, so that you just don't provide it and then when you this gets to the point where the goods and services that places aren't providing are goods and services that are necessary for humans to survive well now you've run into a really hard issue because the only thing that you can do to solve this problem is force people to work and so this is what's happened every single time that communism has been implemented is that eventually you get to the point where like no one has idle hands because the government, if they see you with idle hands, they're going to find a job for you. It don't matter what it is. And of course, in the name of equity or equality, if you want to call it, they're going to guarantee that every single person in the entire country has a job. You're not going to be at home playing video games because you're not going to have free time. Um, now, um, bug just flew right in my eye. Um, So how do we dig ourselves out of this hole? Well, the golly, bub, come on. The the solution to this problem, as I see it, um, is that we need to have a deflationary currency. That is that is the the first, before you can even begin to think about solving it in any other way. Before you even begin to think that, just forget it, forget it. Don't don't even begin until you have a deflationary currency. You cannot begin to solve anything else because. Like I said, there is no regulation, no policy, nothing that you can do for corporations that is ever going to solve this problem. And you can't expect governments to stop spending money either. 
So um, there needs to be a deflationary currency because what that will do is it will allow the average person to be able to accumulate their wealth as opposed to the value of their wealth evaporating. And so, I mean, it's not going to be overnight. That's the thing. I mean, it took us 50 years to dig ourselves into this trench, and it's going to take us probably another 50 years to dig ourselves out. Um, but that is ultimately what's going to be. And you, you can argue, you know, like, or debate, whatever it is that you want to, what it should be, like if it should be gold or it should be silver or it should be Bitcoin. And ultimately, I, in my opinion, it doesn't matter as long as the, as long as it's not something that can be produced ad hoc. Like if it's not something that someone can just click the print button on and produce more of, um, because that is the ultimate cost. The more you, I mean, the ultimate problem. Like the, if you are, it's like a pie, you know? You If you cut a pie into more pieces, you don't make more pie. All you're doing is the pieces are just getting smaller. Like you can, people say, oh, you got five pieces of pie now instead of two. You, you have more pie. No, you don't. Like it's just because the pieces are thinner. It's the same concept. You need to make more pie, and the only way to make more pie is to prove, is to do work that provides values to others. And this is one of the big concepts that I feel like communists don't understand is that not all work produces value, let alone producing value that's equivalent to other work. You know, if I'm standing out in my yard and I'm smacking a tree with a stick, I might be working my butt off. I mean, it could be 110 degrees out there, and I'm really whacking that tree with that stick, but is it producing anything of value? Like, is, is, is someone going to buy the stick? Is someone going to buy... Like a video of me beating a tree with a stick, it's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm doing all of this work, but I'm not producing any value. And this is also one of the reasons why there's an, um, one of the things they yabber about all the time about wage gaps. You know, like, say for example, NBA players. Why do male NBA players make more than female NBA players? Well, the reason why is that more people are willing to pay to watch in male NBA players. It's just the way it is. It's not like the whole everyone collectively, um, collectively decided to discriminate against women and pay them less. People are just more interested in paying to watch the male sports. Pro why? Probably because, let's just be honest, they're better athletes. I mean, take that for what it is. Um, but if we can start off with getting a deflationary currency that would where we would have to begin with tackling this issue um beyond that we would secondary thing we'd have to probably find some way of regulating which companies are in which there needs to be a distinction between the collective and the individual. I think that's the secondary thing, probably. Like, we need to stop treating groups of people as though they are individual people, because they're not. Uh, a group of people can source their... In, can pull together assets in a way that an individual person just can't. And so what this allows them to do is they can steamroll over, the, over other people. So um, we need to create a system that prioritizes the the benefit of the individual over the benefit of the collective. Um, which I almost feel like is opposed to communist ideology, but anyway, that is what it is. So, communism isn't going to save us. Um, capitalism isn't going to save us. I mean, they're basically... Our, we live in a mixed economy. It's not one or the other. Um... But that is what it is, and if you appreciate this video, leave a like, um, subscribe, thanks for watching.